Hi! Today is part two of a two-part video series on bowl cozy sewing. In this video, I'm going to show you actually how to make one, so stick around. If you watched part one, well, you know that cotton may not be your best option for making one of these bowl cozies if you want to use it to cook in inside of your microwave oven. And now I'm going to take it a little bit further in discussing other situations that could cause sparking inside of your microwave, such as metallic fabric. So now you see how this chevron print here has a beautiful shimmer to it, and that is made up of a metallic type of ink and is likely to spark inside of your microwave oven. This one is really kind of hard to detect. It, it looks moreover just beautiful. But if you look really close, you can see there's just a hint of metallic little flecks of glitter that have been implemented into the fabric. Another one that would not be good to use in a microwave. And of course, I think that you can just get the idea now that you should watch out for things like that. Here's a beautiful fabric that could be tempting to use, and it has a little sequin sewn on it. Also a metallic object, also could cause sparking. This one pr probably would just scare you away from it just because it looks like tinfoil. Now this has a similar quality to it that Minky does in that it has a fur surface and fur even though it's not real fur, it it has like lots of peaks and valleys in it and fire can catch onto it should there be a flame already in your oven. It's easier for fire to spread on fabrics that have these little finger-like qualities to the surface. And you can see the metallic in there. Another thing to stay away from for this, this is a lame, which is also has this nice sheen and also would cause sparking in your microwave oven. When I made a bowl cozy for a six inch round bowl and the bottom of the bowl was actually four inches and this bowl which also measures six on the top but the bottom only measures three inches both of these bowls fit equally well inside of a nine inch square piece of fabric. So what you want to do is you want to cut your, your batting to the size you want your bowl cozy to be. And you can have your fabric be a little bit bigger and trim it up as we go, like I've done here, so that you know that your batting is in place. Now, one of the things that you'll find about cotton batting and polyester is that it needs to be secured to the fabric in some way. If you're using those types of battings, you can use our liquid-based basting glue and simply put drops of it on the batting like this, and then just slide your finger across to distribute that. So that it's not one big blob inside of there. And then just lay it down and smooth it out. And that will hold the batting in place. So I'm using 100% bamboo batting. And the reason, one of the reasons I like to use it for this is that it has static cling. So this one has not been glued in any way and you can see that it just kind of stays connected to the fabric. So we do not really have to worry about it shifting. Isn't that nice? But if emotionally you just need to know that your fabric is secured, then go ahead and use the liquid-based glue as I did with the polyester. You just do little dots of it, spread it out, and then set it down. This bowl measures nine inches across on the top and four inches across on the bottom. And I found that a 12 inch square works best for it. This is the Ultra Matte by Caterpillar. And I absolutely love how big it is. And if I need to be able to see through, for instance, I could actually take and place the fabric side down and I can see the batting through it because the board lights up. And you have the ability to reduce the amount of light. Another really neat thing about the, these is that these mats don't slip around on the table as easily as a traditional mat. If you're interested in learning more about these wonderful light tablets, I have a link in the description below to my website where you can learn all of the different options available to you. And I also have a link 
to an unboxing video where I show you this one. This is the basic of the three different options available to you on our site. Because I cut my batting squares to a perfect 12 inch, I can now cut my fabric on top of it without worrying about the fabric being cut perfect. If you have a big a big mat, you could lay out your fabric and your batting and before cutting anything, you could cut out a piece of paper or a plastic template to use for your 12 inch square or cut out a nine inch one for your nine inch bowl sizes. So even though these bowl cozies end up kind of round, they're actually squares. You can make them with reversible, having one color fabric on the top and a different color on the bottom, or having the fabric correspond and be the same on top and bottom. Before sewing, you could take our liquid base glue and go all the way along the perimeter of your batting and secure it so it won't shift on you at all during the sewing process. You're going to take and fold back your square. What you want to do is you want to make sure that the corners line up perfectly and using one of our clips near the corner helps to hold that in place. And also that inside of here that it doesn't fold back on itself. So you want to slide your finger in there and make sure the fabric is flat and do that on both sides. You can use a cutting mat to help guide, you know, where your inch line is and go up an inch and mark it and then measure over one, two, three inches and mark it there. Or you can use a ruler and place it like this and you know that you're marking one inch up and three inches over. Once you've done that, then you just slide and meet your marks. And in this, using the ruler, you don't have to worry about having your fabrics positioned properly. So you can actually spin the fabric around and don't have to keep it lined up with the board once you have the marks. And we're going to go across. And then rather than drawing on this side, I'm going to flip the fabric over. And the reason I'm doing that is because it's easier to sew from this angle rather than starting your needle over here and coming that way. The foot rests on the fabric better. So when I'm looking at it, I draw on the right hand side of the fold and I, I'm going to flip it over and I'm going to draw on the right hand side of the fold one inch up and three inches over. If I were making the smaller bowl, I would go to the two inch mark. And now, once again, connect your lines. I'm gonna repeat that on my other square rather than sewing and then going back to measuring. Place the clip close to the cut edge. And again on the other side, making sure that the fabric didn't fold in on itself on that inside fold. And once again, measure up an inch on the cut side and over three on the folded side. Move the ruler over and then draw from dot to dot. You don't want to go further than that dot. So in this case, if you do shift your ruler, you want to go back and redraw that line. And then if it were more accurate on this side, you can draw an arrow on that side. Or if it's more accurate on this side of the line, you draw an arrow on that side. That way you don't lose track of which line that you should be sewing on. Now you could use any presser foot that you like, a walking foot, or if you have my satin edge foot, this is the foot that I'm choosing to use today. It has this guide that moves by turning this nut and the guide has a little wire that is connected to the actual white guide. And it's gonna help me guide along 
the edge of the actual line on the batting. So with this foot, I can put the needle down and then move the wire over. Now I can look at the white part of the guide instead of the sewing machine needle. I also prefer to start with my needle on the fabric and then move back. That way the tail is inside of the seam. So I just keep my eye right there and I'm gonna back up. And now come forward. And a lot of times we sew quickly on these videos. It's, it's important that you sew the speed that feels comfortable for you. There's no rush to do this project. Take your time and make sure your elbows are resting on the fabric. Know that I'm off centered because I have a camera capturing this close up. And normally I would always center myself with the sewing machine needle. But I want you to really see how this foot helps me to steer without having to look at the sewing machine needle. I just keep my eye focused right there. Keeping the guide right along the edge of the green line. And then I'm going to go off and reverse back up. And now we flip the fabric over and repeat the same we don't have to worry about moving the guide on the foot because it's already positioned properly. Now we'll go back. And come forward, keeping our eye there. If you're using your regular foot on your sewing machine, there should be some line. If not, you can take washi tape and put a little washi tape on the presser foot. And go back up. And cut. Now we're going to go ahead and cut the batting away from the actual stitching line. But on this end here, we want to come relatively close to the actual seam allowance. We want to kind of taper it out. So see how close I get to the seam allowance. And then I pull, come out as like an angle and then take it out. So it's about a little bit bigger than an eighth of an inch seam allowance here and down to pretty close, but not so close that we cut the actual thread. These make really good fillers for dog beds or pillows. If you want to uh, save these in a little bag as I do underneath my sewing table, they really make a fluffy dog bed. Go ahead and do that on the other one. Now this is where I messed up my line. And I know that I was just shy of the dot. I had drawn this, this line first. And the dot was the aim, was what I was aiming for. So that means that arrow is not something I want to pay attention to. So I would have normally only drawn the one arrow to tell myself that that's the line that I want to follow. I'll go back. Normally on batting, I recommend a longer stitch length. And I will do that when we go around the perimeter of the ball cozy when we're finished. But for this stage, we just go ahead and leave it at two and a half millimeter stitch length, which is the equivalent of 12 stitches per inch. Flip it over and here we go. I'm taking two of these little triangles and I'm going to sew them together and keep it handy for the final step of the sewing process. Now we remove the clips and we're going to take and fold it again and do the exact same thing we just did, making sure that the corners are lined up, that our fabric isn't puckering inside of there, and then pin by clipping close to the cut edge, not the folded edge. Do the same thing again. And clip. And then go ahead and do your marking. Mark one inch up. And three inches over. Line up the ruler, mark to mark. and draw from one line to the other. 
you can see how the marks are on the same side. You can also cut using your rotary cutter across if you're nervous about getting close to the actual ink and just take and kind of tip the ruler so that you'll come close looking through and you don't have to worry that you got sloppy with your scissors. The next step is to take and match your right sides together. And this is another time when I use the clips and I clip on each of the outside corners. and the inside corners. Right on the actual seam allowance. You can see I'm lining up the seam allowance so I know it's perfectly in line or as perfect as I can do with my eyesight and then just clamp it. Now that we have all eight areas of importance clipped together that's pretty secure it should stay in place if you like to pin things you're welcome to do that you could also glue using our liquid based basting glue all the way around the actual project except for you don't want to glue about a three inch section between one clip and the other to help you to not forget that this is the area that you're going to leave open I would come in at least a half an inch from one corner and mark, and then mark another half inch in from that first seam allowance. And we're gonna sew all the way around the perimeter of this and then turn it right side out through that actual section. Now, if you'd like to use a walking foot, you're more than welcome to do so. And we wanna make sure you sew forward and reverse at, at, at that point. And that's, we're gonna remove the clip and I plant my finger right on that seam allowance, replacing the clamp. So now we're gonna use a quarter inch seam allowance going from the cut edge over. Use washi tape on your sewing machine to mark where the edge of the fabric should be for a quarter inch. Or if you have a quarter inch foot already, then just go ahead and do what you normally do if you're piecing quilts together ever. With this foot, however, because the guide adjusts, I'm gonna take and place measuring tape beneath the foot. And with the needle in the left needle position, bring the needle down and then turn the nut, moving that wire to the quarter inch mark. And now we know that the satin edge foot is set for a quarter inch seam allowance. Now I'm double checking to make sure that that seam lines up on top and bottom. And with the satin edge foot, we're going to make sure that the fabric's always touching the wire inside the foot and kind of pushing toward the foot rather than pushing or pulling the fabric through. Now, if the foot tips to one side, you can take some of the fabric that you already cut, lower the needle, lift the foot and slide this underneath. And now you can see how the foot is leveled off. So into the point where the two seams line up and lower your needle, lift the foot and pivot. Isn't it interesting how this kind of stays in place? It's kind of like it's arm resting on a pillow while you do the work. As we come up, we're gonna remove the clip and keep our eye focused on pushing that fabric toward the foot. Stop a quarter of an inch in, and you can have washi tape set for that as well. Lower your needle.
if you find that your fabric isn't feeding, you increase the stitch length and then the fabric will feed better. Another important thing to pay attention to is to lower the pressure on the presser foot. That's a mouthful, isn't it? So look inside your instruction manual if you don't know how to adjust the pressure on your presser foot. And when you get to finding that, go ahead and loosen it all the way up to the lightest pressure. Unless you have one of the machines where you have a silver disc on top of the machine and you push it and then it pops up, that is actually the pressure adjustment on an older sewing machine. So you want to put it like, bring it down like a quarter of the of the height when you push and release it all the way, push it down like a quarter of the height of the bar that's sticking out and that will be a light pressure, not too light because we don't, if the fabric doesn't feed once you release the pressure, now the feed dogs are slipping on the fabric and that's why the fabric's not feeding. Now I'm gonna go all the way around. If you find that this starts to slip, you could anchor it on your machine using a piece of washi tape as well. Now you can see when I turn, that I'm not at a quarter inch. That means that I didn't sew far enough up. There we go. And there's my reminder dot to sew, to stop there. And I'm gonna go back and then cut. Next, we want to trim across the corner of each corner. And this is not something this is not something you want to do with your little embroidery thread snips. You want to use an actual pair of shears for this. Cut across. And do that on all four corners. On every one of the inside corners, we want to clip as well. And what I like to do is to come in at an angle and we want to stop shy of the seam allowance. Come in at an angle and then over there. Try not to hit the seam allowance that's coming down as well. So just snip and snip. And then leave that hanging there because it'll add strength to the cozy. Time to turn it inside out, and I like to use one of my wooden pressers to help me so I don't overuse my fingers. And I start with the corner that's closest to the seam, and we're just gonna kinda push it in, and go ahead and form that point. You can also use the other end if you have one of the Appliquick tools for hand applique. You can use this to help form your point. But you don't want to push straight because you might create a hole. So it's kind of like what we're doing is going like that, just kind of rubbing it gently, not too rough, to kind of pull that point out. first corner has formed. Now I'm going to take my fingers inside and push with my thumbs. And as I'm doing this, I'm grabbing and bringing just a little bit and my fingers tuck into this like pocket that I've created on both sides and just kind of scoop and push out. And once you can't push anymore with your thumb, then you flip over and you grab with the presser and kind of pull out. The 
it's like having a really strong thumb. <laughs> and you just keep doing it till you pull it all the way through and it's like you have a deflated football or basketball. <laughs> And it makes me think about maybe making a ball out of fabric. Wouldn't that be fun to have for a baby, for instance? Now we're going to go ahead and form all of the corners. Once you're done pulling all of that through and forming your points, it's a good idea to take it to the iron and press it to make sure it's nice and crisp along the seam allowances. But before I do that, I want to take and fold under where the gap is that we pulled it back right sides out. And I'm going to close that up with the liquid base glue. Just draw a little line. Slide your finger across it and then close it up. And since this is simply water soluble stabilizer in a bottle and there's water in it, once the water evaporates, it's set. You can speed up that drying time by using a hot iron and be on your way to sewing the final step in no time. I have the iron on cotton setting and one of the nice features of my wooden pressers is they don't burn when set against the iron. So you can put it down instead of your fingers right next to that. Shoot steam through there and I then go into the bowl and do it again. It really makes it nice, but what you're really aiming for is that the two folds line up perfectly. You don't want the seam allowance to be off. You want, them, you want it to be balanced on the edge. If you don't iron it correctly and you have it stagger over, it's less noticeable when your fabrics match. You can see how it's forming the shape of a bowl without the actual bowl being in it. This is your opportunity to check and see that it does fit, but we're not quite done. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a edge stitch all the way around the perimeter of this. But another really neat thing that I like to do with my bowl cozies is I like to make a thumb slot. By folding over one of the four corners, you can tuck your thumb right into it and now you don't have to use your fingers to hold on to it. This is nice if you know anyone who's physically challenged, but I personally can't tell you is so much nicer to not have to grasp the bowl and I feel like it's it almost stays in the cozy better by doing that. If you were going to make a reversible one, you would fold the flap over on one side going this way and then flip the bowl over like this for the opposite fabric and then when your bowl is inside you end up with only a flap on two sides protruding out from the outer perimeter of the bowl so instead of having three points flipping out this one would be stitched that way this has had plenty of time to dry and it almost looks as though the seam is already stitched but it's not and we're going to go ahead and go around and this time don't want a quarter inch distance away from the edge because we want to make sure that we're relatively close to the edge of the actual fabrics in order to catch in case your seam allowance wasn't accurate along the inside if you went a little bit narrower than a quarter inch it will ensure that the fabric edges are all folded under and stitched flat simply because this is going to experience a lot of washings. We can move the guide over or I can move the needle back over and that is what I'm choosing to do. I'm going to go ahead and move my needle into the center needle position and now raise the foot and start always into the fabric and now position it down. I'm going to go back first. Now in this case, we're going through four layers of batting and four layers of fabric. So increasing your stitch length to a 3.0 stitch length will make it easier for the fabric to go through. 
or you can opt to use a walking foot if you have one and feel that you need it. I always find it's easier to sew straight or more accurate without a walking foot as the walking foot gives you a little bit more freedom than some of us can handle. As you're going around, you're double checking to make sure that your fabrics are equal on the edge. And then if you're using the satin edge foot, it's a push toward the foot, not grabbing in front and back. We don't ever want to pull our fabric through because you're at risk of breaking needles if you do that. On each corner, you're going to stop and lower the needle, lift and turn. Elbows down and resting on the table as well to take the pressure off your lower back and upper back. If you ever find that you can't get up and over a point like that, we have the presser can be used to help push that down for a split second. And then, but if it still is just tipped too much because maybe you didn't grade enough of the batting away, then you can take an ordinary pack of sewing machine needles and we're going to lower the sewing machine needle into the fabric, raise the foot, tip down on the front of the presser foot and slide those needles in behind the back of the foot. Now with the needles at the back of the foot, it's leveling, it's taking the foot from a tipped position and, and leveling it out so that it will get up and over that bump. And the needles then just pop out the back of the foot and you're ready to continue your path around. I'm using a super non-stick Schmetz universal needle. So if you're at creativefeet.com, you click on universal needles and go all the way down to the bottom of the list and you'll see super non-stick. And the reason it's in the same category as universal is because it is a universal needle, which means it has a rounded tip and it's not going to cut through your fabric, causing it to tear eventually after a lot of use, which is why I rarely recommend a sharp needle when sewing things that will be stretched or sat on or worn. Now you choose where to put your little thumb slot or you can call this done if you're fine with not having that actual thumb support. But you can see it kind of slips around a little bit in there and this one doesn't slip around as much just because my thumb is inside of that. Now some of you may have caught that I didn't do a stitch running down before finishing this actual bowl cozy as you see I have on this one. So that absence of a stitch there is okay because I used bamboo batting. Bamboo batting doesn't tear easily. So if you are going to use a batting and you want to know if you need to add the extra stitch, then take your batting and go ahead and just tear it. And if it tears, well, then you really should secure it with a stitch to help it stay together should anything cause it to stretch and tear, which is partly why I tend to avoid this for quilts that go on a bed because the cotton batting will be tearing inside of the quilt when people sit on it or if children start to jump on top of it. There are two types of 100% bamboo batting. One that has a scrim. A scrim is a fiber that is placed within the batting to hold all the pieces together. And it's what gives this, or the original bamboo batting, a stretchability where it actually stretches out and comes back to its original shape, making it great for quilts. It also has this wonderful quality, it has a very high level of static cling. So when you place fabric on it, it just stays on it. So that means that you really don't need to do as much quilting to hold the batting in place within your quilt. Also, if you try to tear it, it's just, it's terribly difficult to tear. The second bamboo batting does not have a scrim inside of it and it's 
lovely to quilt on. And it also has that high level of static cling, making it stay in place should people jump up and down, up and down on top of a quilt. Obviously, they're not going to be jumping up and down on top of your bowl cozy. However, it means that you don't have to stitch as much to hold the batting together should it ever tear inside of your quilt. And the scrim-free bamboo batting does have the ability to tear, but it still just like takes quite a bit to get a hole to start. And you can see how the fibers kind of stretch and cling to one another as well. But it can tear, except for that static cling has your back and it will hold it to the material. So if you use a batting that tears, you need to do extra quilting to hold the form of your bowl cozy over many uses and washings in case it gets tangled up inside of a towel, for instance, that kind of stretches it as it runs through the wash cycle. Another good option is a fusible batting. The fusing will hold on to the material and it's not going to come off <laughs> even if it's heated because it is heating that makes it actually bond to your fabric. So it's a good option. And since it's 100% polyester and doesn't have any cellulose in it, it is less flammable. In other words, it won't catch on fire all by itself. It needs a fire in order to catch on fire. To position the thumb loop, you want to measure between the two points on the bottom of the bowl. And you want to have the point kind of between those two points. And almost all the way down to where the point of the stitch ended when we constructed the bowl. And we're just going to sew across at a straight line across like that because you want to be able to fit your finger inside. And we'll go across a couple times so that it's really sturdy. So down, go back. And I'm going to go all the way back to that and then come back again and go back again. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's gonna get a lot of holding. You may even wanna do more than one row across. Now I'm using a thread that matches relatively well. If you ever need to get your presser foot to lift high and it's already up, it just doesn't seem like it's high enough, go ahead and take the, the lever that you lift and push up even further. And you have to keep holding it up or it will not stay up but then when you do that you can see that even though my foot is raised right now it's kind of not coming out that easy now i'm lifting it up higher and holding it up and now i can easily slide that out and now my thumb goes in there and that is how i make a bowl cozy i sure hope you enjoyed this video on how to make bowl cozies that you feel a little bit more cozy giving one of these as a gift to anyone that you love and know that the warning label or instructions, proper use instructions are located for free inside of my also free online school, Create with Claire Rowley, found at create.clairerowley.com. And I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.